Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Last Day's Awakening. I'm Jimmy, and I'm really glad that you are here. The last 24 hours, weather-wise, has absolutely been crazy in northern Missouri, and I would imagine that it has been that way for you too, wherever you're at. We went from, oh my goodness, 73 degrees yesterday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to by 6 o'clock in the evening. It was 43 degrees, and this morning when I got up before the sun, it was 14 degrees with a wind chill of 8 below. Amazing. But we have climbed back out of it today and back into the upper 30s. So thank the Lord for that. It's, uh, it's just crazy. It's kind of a reflection of our world right now. Although you can't pin the last days on a 65 degree drop in the weather. That happened when I was a kid. I guess that was the last days too. <laughs> Since 1948, we have certainly been in the last days with the return uh, as a nation by Israel. But we're not going to talk about that this evening so much as to visit a topic that I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago. And uh, some were, were very interested in a little bit deeper dive into the study, and particularly uh, Repo Man. I want to shout out to Repo Man 64. Mike was uh, hoping last week, I guess, uh, as I was coming on live, he was hoping that I would touch the Philip Rapture issue. Uh, I didn't know he wanted me to do that. Uh, I had something tugging on my heart that we did last week, but I thought this is a, a good chance to uh, dig out my notes and re revisit that subject a little bit because um, uh, some found it so interesting. And quite honestly, I've always looked at what happened with Philip as being how the gathering would take place at the end of the tribulation. The, the word that will be used and is used in the story that we're going to read tonight is the word harpazo. We're going to see that. That Philip was... This isn't a word in English, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to make this word up, okay? Don't be offended by that. But he was har, harpazoed. Okay, he was caught away. And the scripture clearly says that, and that's the Greek word. So we're going to revisit that and kind of look at the apocalyptic parallels or the parallels to, to the end of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to go through the entire seven-year period of time known as, as uh, Daniel's 70th week, which is Jacob's trouble. But what happens at the end of it after all the deception has taken place? So Lord, help us to do that. We're going to go to the scripture, and we're going to start reading in Acts chapter 8. We're going to read the story, and, and I'll interject some, some different things as we go along here, but uh, let's, uh, let's get to the passage of Scripture of note that we're going to look at tonight. We're going to dig into this. So here we go. All right. So here is our passage. Now Saul was consenting to his death. So this is right after and during the time of persecution uh, that was seemed to be being led by Saul of Tarsus, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was a zealot. He was zealous for the law, and anything that in his mind interrupted the worship of the one true God, he was going to do his best to remove. And so he was, he was attacking the people of the way who were following Jesus Christ. And when Stephen was brought before the council and preached his sermon, uh, it caused such a ravenous uh, hatred toward him that they stoned him. So they took him out to stone him. He continued to preach even while he was being stoned. But Saul was the one uh, that was giving approval to it and consenting to the death, and they were laying their cloaks at his feet. He was the... He was the leader of that moment. So that's verse 1 of chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was in Jerusalem, which by this time was uh, 
a combo. It was a mixture of Jews and Hellenistic Jews, or those Jews who were of Greek background. They were still Jews, but they were Grecian. They're known as Hellenists. And so there was even a, a, a kerfluffle, can we call it that? It wasn't a full-fledged division, but there was a kerfluffle in the church that the Hellenistic uh, widows were feeling like they weren't, their needs weren't being met while the but while the Hebrew Jewish, you know, purely Jewish, I guess you could say it, uh, widows were having their needs met. And so uh, the apostles got together and said, how can we solve this situation? And they said, look, we're going to devote ourselves to uh, prayer, fasting, and the word. Uh, you choose for yourself uh, godly men, men filled with the Spirit. And that's what took place to... Um, to uh, minister, and so they named seven deacons, and they were all Hellenistic. They all have Greek names, and uh, Philip was one of those. So this is not Philip the apostle. This is Philip, one of the table waiters. That's what the word diakonos means, by the way. It means someone who serves. So these are the servants, and because of the per persecution, they are they are forced to leave, especially the Hellenistic people. The, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem until they were called out to go help with an issue. But the, uh, the persecution against Stephen, bringing about his martyrdom, and his companions had to leave Jerusalem. They were scattered. So that's what this is all about. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stay there. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip, Philippos, Philippos, I guess you would say, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So there are things that are happening. Unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many were paralyzed who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. So the signs that followed these who were preaching the word are the same signs that Jesus himself did, which he said, you know, you'll do these things, and greater greater volume of these things will you do, because it's a combined effort of preaching the gospel, and that's what that meant. Then there's the story of Simon, uh, the sorcerer. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna dig too much into that, but um, he was he believed. The scripture says he believed. Verse thirteen. He believed and was baptized, and he continued with Philip. Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles. All right. So the apostles hear about it. They were at Jerusalem. They heard about what was happening in Samaria, that they had received the word of God. So they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not fallen upon, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, there's going to be controversy in some people's minds. Well, I thought they believed and were baptized. I thought they were saved. They were saved, and the Spirit of God dwelt in them. But just as we see after Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, which is a direct re reflection or a repeat of what God did with Adam when he breathed into Adam the Ruach, the wind, the divine wind, the Holy Spirit, and, and Adam became a living being. So when Jesus breathed on his disciples, after his resurrection, they certainly believed, right? And they received the Holy Spirit, became the temple of the Holy Spirit. But later on, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they're not baptized into Christ at that moment. They were baptized in the Spirit on, on, um, on that Pentecost day, okay? I'm not going to look at when that 50 happened. There are other videos on that that are tremendous. The fact is, they, re they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, immersed in the Holy Spirit, just like a person is immersed in water. Okay. 
So yeah, Simon the sorcerer sees that happen. They they receive the Holy Spirit. So it's there is an evidence that took place that he said, "Oh wow, let me give you some money so that I can do that too." So he's immature, and uh, and, and he's following after a uh, an idea that something of God can be bought, purchased, or sold, and he is rebuked by Peter for it. And then comes this verse 25. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, you'll notice the they there is going to include all, both Peter and John, and it includes Philip. They're returning to Jerusalem. Verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Underline that in your mind, because it's going to show up in the parallels. This is desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, underline that, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran up to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him, the place in the scripture which he read was this, he was led as sheep, as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and he was declared, pardon me, and he will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. So that comes from Isaiah chapter 53. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom did the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amazing. Where does that verse show up again? Ooh, Romans chapter 10. Hmm. (laughs) Okay. So, verse 38, let's get that to the top. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. He dunked him. That's immersion. He immersed him in the water. You know, what was it, six inches deep, ten feet deep? I don't know. He immersed him in the water. Now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. We're going to deal with that in a minute. So that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The picture there is the eunuch sees him, and then he doesn't see him, and he didn't see him anymore, and then he went on his way rejoicing. Something wild and crazy just happened. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay, so there are some things here we want to talk about. We're going to go over some notes that I have created, and I will once again pin these notes into the comments. They're they're kind of... You know, the way I do notes isn't like uh, A, B, C, D, you know, point one, point two, point three. I, I just kind of go the way my mind flows, but I'll let you have a picture of, of my nuttiness just by being able to see these notes. And um, so we'll, we'll go over the notes really quickly, and then we're going to get to the, to the really important, powerful points. Here we go. So Philip's in Samaria, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So he's preaching the gospel, Yehoshua. That's the name that is here, Jesus. So it's not just Yeshua, but it is, it is the full name, the Yehoshua, the anointed. That's what Christ means, Christos. 
Remember that Jesus has been through Samaria, he's been through Sychar, many believed in him as Messiah, and bas- baptisms took place. So the, the common thing here is that the gospel is repenetrating at, uh, at, at this uh, a dispersion of the Hellenistic Jews and other Jews as well, but particularly the Hellenists, the deacons went out and preached, uh, the sorcerer believed, and, and all of that. So we'll go on beyond that. I put that in there. We read the story. Uh, Philip headed back to Jerusalem with Peter and John. That's the they of that verse. Um, amazing. Then comes the interesting part of the story. An angel spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south to the, this desert. This is desert. So at the words of an angel, and, you know, I'm going to add, add thoughts here. I'm going to add thoughts here kind of logically, uh, because he is most likely with Peter and John going down to Jerusalem and uh, maybe even already arrived at Jerusalem, he, he, he gets a word from an angel, and I bet he, he approached Peter and John and said, I just uh, received word from an angel that I'm supposed to go do this. Probably got confirmation for them, but the word doesn't say that. But I think that's probably how we're supposed to function. If you have a dream, a vision, or a word from, from an angel, there are some confirmations, some witnesses that you need to have. Number one is the, the witness of the word of God. Secondly is a witness of other believers that can confirm that what you heard was actually what you heard or what you dreamed was actually from God. So there are some witnesses. A lot of people have their dreams on YouTube, and and they're very interesting, but I don't count them as the Word of God. I don't count them as the Word of God unless they line up with the Word of God. So that's a very, very interesting point. So he arose and went and met the Ethiopian. So I want to talk about just a little bit of history about Ethiopia and the Jews, because here is this eunuch who is basically the uh, CFO. He's the chief financial officer under Queen Candace of the Ethiopians. And Ethiopian tradition, I've done some long studies on Ethiopian tradition, uh, because the Ethiopian uh, Christianity in Ethiopia is, 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 I mean, it's older than modern-day Christianity. It, it's very old. There are reasons for that. Uh, but Ethiopian tradition recognizes that there was a relationship between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, you remember that she went to Jerusalem to see all the glories of the temple, this beautiful temple and the palaces and everything, and she's just stunned at what Solomon has done. But their tradition says... It's kind of backed up a little bit by the the flow of the scripture that took place because Solomon had this propensity to go after women. And he married, what did he have? 700 wives. A lot of those are treaties that he established with surrounding nations, but 700 wives and 300 concubines. So this guy was kind of a, I'll not go there, but the tradition was that that the Queen of Sheba also had a relationship with Solomon, and in fact, had a child with Solomon. And so, uh, the line of David, in, you know, in the least, the line of, of Jews was begun, you know, was started, and uh, translated to Ethiopia which makes great sense because there there were hundreds of thousands of Ethiopian Jews who, you know, black African Jews who were airlifted and have been airlifted over the years to Israel, back to Israel. So they've made the, the heritage, the trip, the journey back to Israel as Ethiopian Jews as Ethiopian Jews. So where'd they come from? Well, the tradition says they came from this line that was begun by Solomon. The story even goes a little further, and you can research these things yourself. They don't really have too much to do with this story other than logic, but the picture was that uh, as Solomon was careening deeper into idol worship from all his wives and concubines, 
that the high priest and the son of Solomon by by uh, Sheba, the queen of Sheba, hid the Ark of the Covenant, made a replica of the car- Ark of the Covenant, uh, and took the replica, or the original, back to Ethiopia. Now that's the story. I believe the Ark of the Covenant probably has been found. It is deep under the Temple Mount, and they're just waiting to bring it out when the new temple is constructed. But the tradition is there because it is so connected to the Jews. Now, here are the questions that I have. In the end, there, there had to be Jews. There are many, many hundreds of thousands of Jews in Ethiopia that end up going back to Israel. Where'd they come from? That's the question. Uh, secondly, could this eunuch have been of that heritage of Solomon? And here are the evidence that he probably was. He has come down to Jerusalem to worship, not just as a proselyte, but he's come down to worship, and he is reading from Isaiah. Now, this leads me to believe that he was there during the first portion of the feast, or the spring feast, that he was there during Passover, during the Feast of first fruits, and probably all the way out to Shavuot the first 50 days out from first fruits, the first Shavuot, okay, the first Pentecost, I should say it way. It's called Shavuot. And, of course, this is later on. This is years after the, the events of Jesus, but there are still happenings there that have, that have caused him to say, i got to search the scriptures over these things, and could it have been, could it have been the results of the stoning of Stephen and the persecution of the Hellenistic Jews that had to scatter, and he's there in the aftermath of that questioning, why are these Jews worshiping another? Okay, so this is logical flow, all right? So this leads me to believe that it's the early, it's the spring feast season. He has seen something that has caused him to search the scriptures, meaning he has had he has the scroll of Isaiah. Now think about that. If this is just a Gentile proselyte, how does he have a scroll and he's reading the scroll of Isaiah? These were scrolls that were only found in the synagogues. These were not everyday um <laughs> Like we used, they used to have, Gideon's used to pass out gospel, so you could get a gospel of Matthew, gospel of Mark, Luke, John, etc. You could get a gospel, a little thing about that big. You could read it, put it in your pocket, or pocket Bible. This was not that. This was the scroll. This was a parchment of some sort uh, or scroll that he's reading from Isaiah. So he had access. He's it's in his possession, meaning he brought it with him, most likely. Which leads you to another question. Were there synagogues in Ethiopia? Well, after the time of Nebuchadnezzar, while the Jews were in Babylon and over that period of time, they didn't have a temple. The temple had been destroyed, so they started the gatherings, the synagogues, and the synagogues were the meeting places where the scriptures were read. And this has carried forth even to today. The synagogues exist. They gather together. They worship. It re- kind of replaces the temple for them in their uh, in their gathering to worship the Lord and to read the scriptures, to fellowship with one another, and the church is patterned after that. They had synagogues in Ethiopia. Why? Was it because of, that they were Jews, or was it because the tradition of the Jews in Babylon spread to the other Jews in that area? which includes Ethiopia, push that area. Hmm, I think that's the case. I think that's the case. So there's, these questions are there. Got to answer them yourself. But this is what's leading me to believe that there are some pretty powerful parallels in this. Whatever the case, the eunuch is reading, and, um, and he's reading from Isaiah uh, chapter 53 about the Lamb who has come to slaughter. And he asks the question, uh, is, the, is the prophet speaking of himself, or is he speaking about some other man? Interestingly enough, the Jews today see Isaiah chapter 53 
as being the nation of Israel. So it's not the prophet suffering, it is the nation of Israel suffering. And they see Israel as being that one. They don't recognize the slaughter, the, the slaughter of the Passover lamb, they, uh, being Jesus. They, they don't recognize Yehoshua as being Messiah. They certainly don't see him as the Passover lamb. They're, they're looking at their Messiah to come and to rescue them. They missed and chose not to believe, right? They chose not to believe that Jesus is their Messiah who died for their sins, became the Passover lamb. So they, they disregarded all of the typology. They disregarded the patterns from, from Passover, uh, Nisan 1, all the way up through uh, all feasts throughout the year. They chose to disregard Jesus as fulfilling those. And so they, um, they have been blinded. Here is what Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 27 says about it. They have they've come under partial blindness, and they will stay that way until they believe. Here's what Paul says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. So the eunuch, think about this. The eunuch typifies the Jews at the end of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble is the trouble that is initiated against God's covenant people, the Jews, and that trouble is because they have rejected Jesus, they have disobeyed God, they have made a mockery in many cases over the centuries of the glory of God, and so through the revelation of the Antichrist, Israel, the Jews left among the nations, are going to be tormented. They're going to follow the faults because they rejected the true, and the result will be incredible suffering. Jesus said that time will be like no other. In fact, that's not just for Israel. It's going to be for the whole world. That's what this thing called the tribulation is, is about, the judging of God of the nations for having rejected Jesus. But, but the suffering of Israel to bring them to Jesus. So there, there are two things running parallel, the tribulation, judgment against the world, and the suffering of the Jews, again, the worst suffering in their history. And, and many, many, many will die. And uh, because they have rejected Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, and, and that's what he was reading, Isaiah. It's not Ezekiel, or, or I mean, pardon, not Ezekiel. It's not uh, Elijah. Uh, it's, it's Isaiah, all right? They're going to come to belief. So we see that from Romans chapter 11, but it's going to be through great suffering. So the picture of this is in the story of Philip and the eunuch, and here's the sequence that I find very fascinating that parallels. Philip is one of the Hellenistic table waiters. We talked about that. Persecution of the Hellenistic Jews led Saul of Tarsus to, uh, to be kind of the ramrod of the stoning of Stephen, and uh, therefore, verse 8, pardon me, chapter 8, verse 4, Acts, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, everywhere preaching the word of God. I need to slow down. I'm going to get all tongue-tied. There's just a lot here. So Philip goes down to Samaria. Philip begins preaching Jesus. This is what he does. Uh, and the result of that is this call, this uh, command by the angel to go down to the desert. And there he preaches to the eunuch. And if I'm correct, this eunuch is of Jewish heritage. He's reading Isaiah. He's out of a synagogue in Ethiopia. He's come for the feast. He's been worshiping God. Something has caught his attention 
a sign of some sort, some event, something was happening that made him be reading the scripture, that the Spirit of God began to speak to his heart and arranged for the meeting between Philip the Evangelist, Philip the Evangelist, to speak with him, okay? So the eunuch is ready to, to be converted. Uh, Philip preaches the truth. The eunuch has the revelation of the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he makes this statement, what prevents me from being baptized? Huh. Now he's thinking, he's thinking purely Jewish terms here. I want you to understand this, which is a further evidence that this guy has Jewish heritage. Because he's not speaking about uh, just normal, you know, Christian baptism. No, he didn't have a clue what baptism was. He's talking about the mikvah. The mikvah, and there are many mikvahs, but the mikvah was the pool that you would descend down to. So the priest would go to the mikvah, and he would wash himself in the mikvah, mikvah and come back out to do his service. The high priest had to do this. How many times? I don't remember the number of times. He had to wash himself in the mikvah several times before he could put on the priestly robes to go in once a year into the holy place. So it symbolized some cleansing going on that had to happen, but it was also a declarative act. So if you, and this is what John was doing, John the Baptist, John is saying, repent, and believe the kingdom of God is at hand. So he's not calling them to Christ, right? He's calling them to change. He's calling them to change their minds. He's calling them to come out of what they're doing and prepare themselves for the kingdom of God. That's what he's doing. And it's a mikvah. The Jordan River becomes a mikvah, and he's baptizing them, and they are Basically, in that moment, declaring, I'm ready for the kingdom of God. I'm ready for the kingdom of God. Um, the mikvah, in, in, any, in any instance, for instance, if you have, uh, were of one sect of the Jews and you were following a certain rabbi, and another rabbi comes along that has a different view of, uh, of the Tanakh uh, and, and the Talmud and, and, and even of the, the Mishnahs, you know, the, the commentaries of the Tanakh and the Talmud and the Torah. And you say, look, uh, Rabbi Bill over there I've been following, but I, I'm going to bring myself into a, a different place. I'm going to change direction. I'm going to follow Rabbi Steve. And so to do that, you'd make a declaration. You'd wash yourself of the old and come out with the new. So you would go down into a mikvah and wash off the old and come out into the new. You would follow the new rabbi. Huh. So suddenly, here's this Ethiopian Jew, and he understands, I, I need to wash myself. I need to change my allegiance. Oh, because now I have realized that Jesus has come. I need to change my allegiance to Christ. And he's thinking he's going to clean himself. And this is the way that you do it. But Philip shows him the way. He says, you can be baptized, but you've got to believe with all your heart in Jesus Christ, right? And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, so let's baptize you. So the Enoch, or so Enoch, the eunuch professes faith in Christ Jesus as the Son of God. He believes fully in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Philip baptizes the eunuch, right? That's the, that's the mikvah moment. I'm changing my allegiance from whatever I believed about the law to I'm changing my allegiance to Jesus Christ. I'm washing away the old. I'm dead to the old, coming out as new, awaiting the resurrection that will come. So baptism isn't baptismal regeneration. Baptism is the sign that you are changing. You've changed that something has happened in you. And in our case, it's you have been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Spirit of God lives in you. Now your allegiance goes fully to Jesus. You're baptizing yourself, or being baptized, I should say, to, and, and leaving the old and coming up new. That's the whole point. So when this happens, 
And you see it on the notes already, don't you? Some of you got excited there. I heard you catch your breath. When he comes up out of the water, when, when, when they come up out of the water, then, pardon me, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip, not, not the eunuch. He caught Philip away. So he's got another task for him. He caught Philip away and took him 30 miles away to Azotus, which is another name for the city of Ashdod. That's on the coast. So they're heading south toward Gaza. At some point, he is, you know, they've come out of the desert back to where there's water again. That's how he could be baptized. They're, they're nearing Gaza, which was a beautiful area. And he is suddenly caught up. That's the word harpazo. This is the Greek term harpazo. If you look at this, the, the Spirit of the Lord, harpazo. So the word is harpazo. The, the term Philip or the name Philip does not appear. It's just the Spirit of the Lord. The subject is that the Spirit of the Lord took Philip. Harpazo caught him away, snatched him away, took him 30 miles, and deposited him in Azotus. That's the word harpanzo. Now, many people still get all the knee-jerk reactions about when I use the term rapture and others of us use the term rapture. It's not in the scripture. It's not there. It's a made up by John Darby. It's me- No, it's the word harpanzo. From the, from the uh, fourth century, the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, Jerome translated this word rapiemer, rapiemer. And another word for rapiemer is rapturo, and we even come down to raptos. They're all they're all derivations of the word rapiemer. That is where we get the English word rapture. It's a direct. We know what we're talking about. Right? The others get all excited. Well, it's not in the Bible. Yeah, it is. Harpazo. It's there. And so Philip is harpazo. Wow. Put the D on the end. It's not in Greek, but harpazo. He is caught away. Zip. He's gone. So the the eunuch sees him, and then he's gone, and he doesn't see him. The eunuch gets back in the chariot and continues on his way rejoicing. It doesn't mean that Philip walked off, you know, and and he watched him walk up, you know, into the into the sunset because he's going northwest. It's not what it means. Harpazo, gone. Did I emphasize that enough? All right, let's move on. The parallels of the final chapter of Jacob's trouble are amazing to me. Here they are. First of all, Jacob's trouble mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for that great day is great so that none is like it. So that day is a time. How do we know that? It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So the day is a period of time. Once again, those of you who who are stuck on the day of the Lord just being the day when Jesus returns to to the Mount of Olives at Armageddon, actually to Jerusalem, but we'll, we'll worry about that at a different day. Uh, and, and he slaughters his enemies. That's the day of the Lord. No, the day of the Lord actually is, is a long period of time. The day of the Lord is the day in which he purposefully begins judging the world until the new heavens and the earth come into reality. So it's a period of time from when Israel becomes a nation again now he has something to work with in Israel. His promises are, are, promises are fulfilled. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, the promise to the land and the promise to the people that they would be re- reunited. The picture of the dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37, and then the reiteration of that in chapter 38 and 39. Those promises of Israel returning are fulfilled. That means now the day of the Lord is approaching because we're in the final the final generation, the fig tree generation. 
And that final generation brings about, or brings us to the point when the Lord says, now is the time. And he begins the day of the Lord. That day of the Lord begins with the catching away. It is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. It's the beginning, because we have to be gone. We have to be gone before the revelation can begin, before the seals can be opened, and so on and so forth. The Jews that are not believing in Jesus Christ are going to suffer. The Jews who now believe in Jesus Christ are flying away. Harpazo. So, the Jews who survive to the end of Jacob's trouble, or Daniel's 70th week, will see something that will cause them to mourn. Why will they mourn? Because they will have been deceived. They will have been deceived by this son of perdition, this antichrist figure, the personification of the beast, Daniel's little horn. You know, how many many ways can we say this? And uh, this one will deceive them. They will receive him as Messiah. But halfway through the the period known as the tribulation, or Daniel's 70th week, according to Daniel chapter 9, He will enter the temple, he will declare himself to be God, and he will commit an abomination that causes desolation to the temple. It's it's bringing uncleanness back into the temple. He will set up the image of the beast in the temple. That's an idol. He will do this and claim to be God. He will claim to be Messiah. They will have looked at him as being Messiah, and suddenly with him bringing an image into the temple. I mean, it's like, I said I had a V8, right? It's like, it will dawn on them, this is false, and that, then the Lord will open a way for them to flee into the desert. That's, that's a whole different picture, or a different, different part of the timeline we don't have to look at today. We don't have time to do it, but... Uh, a remnant will escape into the de- uh, into the desert. Whatever the case, there will still be Jews scattered around the world. There will be a remnant being protected in the desert, and there will be Jews still in Jerusalem who are going to suffer mightily for three and a half years, and many, most, are going to be killed. You can read this in Zechariah 12 and 14. So they've been deceived. But a sign will come, something will come that will cause them to mourn, and they will search for the truth. So just as the eunuch has seen something that has caused him to search through his scriptures, the the book Isaiah, I mean, once again, he's probably Jewish, he has access to Isaiah, he has seen something that has caused him to go to the scripture to search this out. The Spirit leads him to the most wonderful passage of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God for our sins, for our iniquities. He's chastised on our part for us. And he reads that, and he's wondering, who is Messiah? What is this about? And here comes the truth. The evangelist comes to him, shares with him the truth, and he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Now let's look at a couple of things. I touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but I'll come back to it. So Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So the spirit of grace is that he will, he will relent, he will favor them in their suffering and put on them the desire to seek supplication. They're going to seek. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Then Zechariah chapter 12 goes on and kind of lists everybody who's mourning. So it's, it's the whole nation. Jesus said it this way, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often? I wanted to gather your children together. Gather your children together. Gather. Do I need to repeat it a third time? Gather your children together as a hen 
gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You don't want to be gathered. You won't be gathered. Okay, I'm just going to make that. See yourself. Uh, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there's going to be a recognition of Jesus, the one who came in the name of the Lord, not only in the name of Yahuwah or Yahweh, but came in the name. He's in the name Yahweh. He's in the name. Yehoshua, Yeshua is in the name Yahweh. He's the salvation of the Lord. Wow. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7 through 9. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, so this is Jacob's trouble, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, all right. Okay, let me do my paraphrase. All right, all right, now they're my people. They were covenant people, but they had rejected his name. They had rejected the one who came in his name and revealed his name and revealed the Father. But they're going to turn. They're going to call on his name, and he's going to say, Now, they're my people. And each one will say, The Lord is my God. And they're going to come to full understanding. At that point, there is a harpazo. This is what happened to Philip. It wasn't a vertical harpazo, but it was a horizontal harpazo. I've heard, I've heard people tear this apart almost sinistry, sinisterly by saying, yes, we believers through the Holy Spirit can, uh, can use astral projection to go and minister for Christ. Hogwash, that's a Greek term, sorry. Hogwash, that's, that's the occult. No, we go physically to preach the Word of God, but in one instance, one instance, so it's not normative in the Scripture, one instant to show something. Philip is harpazo to another place. Okay, somebody's texting me. He's harpazo to another place. That's not what's, <coughs> pardon me, that's not what's going to happen to us. That is not what's going to happen to us. And we're going to be harpazo vertically, but Philip was taken from location to location on the earth. I'm choking myself up. Some of you are going to laugh. That's okay. You choke yourself up. You choke yourself up. Okay. So it's a horizontal catching or gathering. Philip is gathered up and taken to another place, 30 miles away. Now that just kind of proves you don't, you don't get 30 miles in a day. No, he's found in Azotus. Imagine that. Woo, I'm in Azotus. I'm in Ashdod. Okay, what am I going to do? I've got to get up to Caesarea, and I'm going to preach my way up there. So he makes his way up the coast, up above Tyre, where the city of Caesarea was located. Okay, Caesarea by the sea. Look what Jesus said, because this is prophesied, this horizontal catching away. And this is very important because this horizontal catching away is confused by those who believe in post-tribulation rapture. They believe it's a gathering of all of the believers in Jesus Christ, which is true, but it is the only gathering of believers in Jesus Christ by harpazo. The word harpazo isn't used, so I don't know how you come to that conclusion. But uh, from this verse, they believe, okay, all the Christians are going to be taken to Jesus to meet Jesus in the air as he comes back to Jerusalem. 
Well, that's not the case. We go up to the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And according to John chapter uh, 14, verses 1 through 3, we're going to Father's house. So this isn't a horizontal harpazo like Philip's harpazo. Our harpazo is going to be a catching away to the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and go to Father's house. And all of the sevens, again, all of the types and symbols of the sevens, so the seven years, seven days to uh, consummate a wedding, the, the, the bookend feast, you know, the Sabbath at the start, the Sabbath at the end, all of it pictures uh, this wonderful uh, catching away of the body of Christ to heaven and uh, to be in Father's house, which Father's house at the end, some have been, okay, I don't see the bride of Christ. Bride of Christ is the church caught up. It's both Jew and Gentile, male and female, rich and rich and uh, you know, uh, free and slave, rich and poor. It's caught up to this great time of consummation, and at the end of it comes a feast. You know, it's the celebration after the consummation is the feast, and then after a, a period of time, the the New Jerusalem Father's house, our home right, will come down out of heaven after the new earth, new earth has been created for it. It will come down as a bride adorned for her husband. What does that mean? It means our home is adorned with the bride. The bride, New Jerusalem, is our home. Everything about it. God lives there. He's the light. The temple is at the top. The shining, the beautiful light, everything about it comes from God who is at the center. He will be with us. We will be with him. And that new Jerusalem as a bride will come down. That means the bride occupies the place. It's a whole nother study. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, and he will send his angels. This is at the end of Jacob's trouble. It's at the end of Daniel's 70th week. It's at the end of the tribulation and even if you want to delineate between great tribulation and tribulation, go for it. It's at the end of the seven that this takes place. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, these are directionals. These We talked about this two weeks ago. It's the word anemos, which means the base directions of the wind from the north the south, the east, and the west. Did I get that backwards? The north, the south, east, and the west. So it's a redundancy. He's going to capture them, harpazo them, from all the directions of the earth, from one end of heaven to the other. The word is akros, being the end, one end of the Oranos. The Oranos is the term used for heaven. It can be first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. In this case, the Oros, this root word of Oranos or Oros, it means the mounds and the masses, meaning the continents. So it's one end of the continents to the other. He gathers them by his angels at the sound of a trumpet. Woohoo! At the sound of a trumpet. There are many trumpets. Many, many trumpets. Oh, my goodness. Gathering blasts. Don't get stuck on the, on the seven trumpet judgments. Well, the rapture doesn't happen until the sixth trumpet. Well, that's not the last one. The last one ushers in the vials. Stop and, and think through, pray through. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. Wow. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his head were many crowns on his head. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called Word God, and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's only for the redeemed. Only for the redeemed. Followed him on white horses, out of his mouth, 
goes a sharp sword with it, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule with the rod of iron. He will tread pay, he will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robes and on his thigh name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay, the whole picture here, and uh, I'm I'm going to mess around here just a little bit. The whole picture of this. Uh, I'm going to draw it just really easily so that you can see this. If I can get my pencil to function properly and not make a huge, huge mess. So what I'm going to do here, uh, I'm going to get up a proper pen. Okay, here we go. Proper pen, there's a line. I'm going to put a line right here in the middle. And I'm going to call this the return of Jesus. Okay? That's at the end of the seven years. Okay? It's the end of the seven years. This is a period of time. Jacob, trouble, Daniel's 70th week. And the revelation spells out the tribulation. All right, seven years has a halfway point. The Jews, the Jews will at some point in the first three and a half years rebuild the temple. Could it be before? Yeah, I suppose, but. Uh, once again, the way I look at this, it's just me, and I could be totally and completely wrong. Isaiah 17 comes into play because the, the greatness and the glory of their economy and their power right now is going to go downhill. They're going to come into a covenant or be forced to follow a covenant with the many, I should say it this way. But one of the benefits of the covenant or... Uh, you know, the uh, appeasement to Israel will be the temple. You all know of the, the red heifers, right? They're ready. Will they sacrifice the red heifers this Passover season? I don't know, but it sure looks like they're heading that way. This has to happen to dedicate the mound and the area where the temple will be built, and then to dedicate the altar, and then to dedicate the priest. So there, the red heifers have to be burnt to ashes. The ashes will be used several times. The temple will be rebuilt. Where will we be? Can I just say it this way? With <laughs> harpazod, with the English attacks. We're going to be at harpazod. raptured, right? We're going to be gone, caught away, caught up, caught away. This begins. Then comes the three and one half year point when Antichrist is revealed. To who? To the Jews. And we're not going to talk about tribulation saints right here, but you know, they're they're coming to Jesus in mass, I believe, right here. By here, and maybe a little after, they're going to be murdered, beheaded. Okay? And what leads me to believe this it's to this point is because this is the resurrection of the two witnesses. Two witnesses. And with the two witnesses, I believe, are the mid-trib resurrection. So there's a resurrection. If you want to call it a rapture, call it a rapture. But it's certainly a mid-tribulation resurrection of the two witnesses, and I believe the, the those who have died in the faith. And there, there won't be many left except the 144,000 
who will continue to preach. They can't be touched, ever. Can't be touched. Then comes, according to Jesus, at some point, a sign of, do I have room here? The Son of Man. Some of you guys have these wonderful charts. I mean, your charts are so wonderful. The, I don't have one, so I'm, I'm drawing it out. You're just going to have to deal with me. <laughs> this is with my pencil, not your beautiful chart. And you have wonderful charts. I love, I love what you've done. Uh, this is my mess, but there's a sign in the heavens. Or, once again, sign in the heaven, Oranos. So is that in heaven itself, or in the heaven, or... You know, the atmosphere. Or just, you know, maybe outside the atmosphere, but everyone on the earth, especially all the Jews, will see the sign of the Son of Man. What is that? It's going to cause the Jews around the world who have been given the spirit of grace and supplication to search out what that means and they're going to have the help of the 144,000. They're going to have the help of the Spirit of God. They are going to, they are going to, Baruch, ba, ba Shem. They're going to cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're going to call on the name and they will be saved, okay? So let me move that out of the way, and let's get to a little bit better, bigger, smaller, I don't know, amplified picture. They're going to see the sign. I'm going to put a cross in there because that just may be it, something that's going to make them understand Jesus. Yeshua, all right? They're going to cry out. They're going to believe. And then the Lord is going to harpazo. He's going to send out his angels and gather them up. Harpazo them. He's going to gather them up, translate them from one end of the earth to the other to Jerusalem. And Maybe simultaneously or just be, just after that calling to Jerusalem is the return. Now, who is with him? They're caught up. They are caught away. They are caught over. Horizontal, right? It's a horizontal move like Philip's move. We are the robed in white. Linen, pure, and clean, coming with Jesus. So we are the hosts. It's not the angels. Angels have been doing this. The hosts riding on horses. We're coming with him, right? They're coming this way, we're coming that way. This is what the end will look like. And then comes this uh, filling up of the, the valley of Jehoshaphat with blood. This is, this is around Jerusalem. It'll go all the way from Megiddo, the gathering place, to Jerusalem and the nation's armies will be destroyed. The world, the world will see Jesus coming back. And there you have it. So the whole picture of Philip only happening once in the Bible. It's only one time in the Bible as far as a, uh, an individual, uh, a story of an individual being harpazo, caught away from one place to another. It's only one place, and it is the story of Philip and it is right after he has shared the gospel with a, I'm going to call him a Jew. He's of the Jewish heritage. He is seeking after the truth of Messiah. 
He receives the truth from the evangelist. The evangelist, led by the Spirit of God, has gone down to him and shared with him, opened his eyes to the Scripture. He has taught him about Jesus. The man believes with his whole heart, is baptized. So after the sequence of of events, there's the desert, going through the desert, and then coming to the place of the water for baptism. Going through the time of Jacob's trouble, the desert the worst time in all of Israel's history, and then coming to that place where a sign causes them to look, and the gospel comes to them. They receive Jesus Christ. They cry out, Baruch HaBaba Shem Adonai. They call out to the name Yehoshua, Yeshua. They understand. They understand. They'll receive him as Lord. They mourn for having pierced him, and they're gathered. They are gathered from the four winds of the Oros, the mountains and the continents. The Oros, not from heaven, from Oros. When that happens and they're gathered into Jerusalem, (laughs) the times of the Gentiles are completely over because Jesus comes back and judges and sets up his rule. So the, the fulfilling of the time of the Gentiles is at the end of the tribulation. And we're not talking about the church talking about the end of the tribulation, is the end of the times of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles rule the world. Jesus sets up his rule and his reign, and it's for a thousand years, and there's more on that we can talk about, but we won't because time is getting away from us. So I hope this has helped. I've got a little, I've gotten a little quick in the uh, expounding of it, and when I get too quick, I get a little tongue-tied. Forgive me for all of that, but Trying to cram it all into a small space has been rather difficult, but I hope that helps. And I hope it is a puzzle piece to those who are still saying and believing, no, that's the post-tribulation rapture. Well, it is, but it's not for the believers in Jesus Christ right now. It is for the Jews who will come to Christ at the end of Jacob's trouble. They will be gathered to Jerusalem, not up. We're coming down. They've got to go over, and we meet at Jerusalem. And I hope that helps you understand the power and the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture. All right, so hang in there. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep telling people about Jesus. Time is running out so quickly, and uh, I don't expect it to go on much longer. But as long as it goes on, we are going to be about the Father's business. Amen? Because we can do it through Christ who strengthens us. I love you all. God bless you. Dig into the word. The Lord will help you.